That cannot be the point of our life. So why is that being taught? What did he just experience as we read last week about Jesus dealing with the Pharisees? You remember? They loved money. And they had connected the fact if you have money, then God loves you. And in their mind, the more money they had, that meant they were better with God than the people around them. And so what Jesus is saying in this situation is, guys, my disciples, don't be like the Pharisees because if your wealth fails you and you have that connected to God's love and approval in your life, when the wealth fails, what are you going to feel? Rejected by God. You're going to sense that God doesn't care about you, that everything is horrible, that God is abandoning you because wealth has failed. And he's saying, look, wealth is going to fail. It's going to fail. How many of us were around for the stock market collapse? 2007, 2008. Y'all remember the fun we were having back then? All you folks on retirement income, your retirement income did what? Wealth failed. And so, here Jesus is saying to the sons of light, the things that God has placed in your hands to use, even things in this world that are going to fail, use them for eternal purposes. Use them for godly purposes. So, he is praised by the master, not for honesty, not for integrity, but for shrewdness in this principle. If you would, notice in verse 10, Jesus then makes an application. I want you to notice the things that are highlighted here today. He who is faithful. In a very little thing, is faithful. He who is unrighteous, in a very little thing, is unrighteous, also in love. Now they're highlighted because sometimes we look at a passage and we don't slow down. This is why we try to encourage you maybe to get involved with the precept ministries course when we teach that in discipleship. All precept courses do is help us learn to slow down and rightly divide the word of truth. As we see this, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful all, also in much. In other words, in my life, if I have become a person of integrity and character because of the work of God in my life, and, and I'm given small assignments by God, and I'm faithful, can God then give me greater assignments? Yeah. That's what Jesus is saying. And so, as you may recently have become a Christian, and you're saying, well, I can't do any of the things that people do in that church. I couldn't teach a Sunday school class. I couldn't, you know, be a, a deacon. I, I couldn't do this. I, I couldn't be a head of the women's ministry. I, I couldn't be the director for outreach. I, I couldn't go on Monday nights and make those visits. I, I don't know what to do. What God is saying to us here is be faithful to do the things that God gives you to do today. Even if it's a little bitty thing in which you're called upon to help someone in some small way or to speak truth in a situation in a loving way where in the past you would just let sleeping dogs lie and let people suffer the consequences of not knowing Christ or not knowing a biblical truth. And as we do those little things today and God sees that we're going to be good stewards, good managers of the things that he puts in our life and experience, then he can then train us and build us and Jesus can begin to stand up within us and we can be useful for God for greater and greater purposes. Not because we're great, but because we're available and because we're clean in his eyes to be a vessel in which he can pour out his love and his spirit into the lives of other people. Now, it's opposite is true. If you're not righteous, 
with the little things God gives. We we have you know a situation where you know maybe the church is looking for deacons, and in the process of of that happening in any church in, in the country, Baptist or no, there are going to be some people that the church family is going to say, "Would you consider being a deacon?" And that individual is going to be overwhelmed by the fact that God would use choose to use them in that way. And they're going to be prayerful. And they're going to be uh, urgently wanting to know from God. God, do you want really to use me in this way? Because I, I, I can't do that in myself. Unless I'm doing that in you, it's just not going to happen. And yet in the same room, there could be a person sitting there who doesn't walk with the Lord on a daily basis. They don't come to anything more than maybe Sunday morning church from time to time. They're not in discipleship. They're not in Bible study. They don't have a regular prayer time. They're not serving God regularly, consistently in any kind of way. And they're offended because they didn't get asked to be a deacon because they've grown up in that church and everybody knows them. Is serving God in the calling that He places on our lives through the spiritual giftedness that He gives each and every believer something that we deserve to have because we grew up with a certain group of people meeting in a certain building? Not in the eyes of God. He's looking at our stewardship. Now why would God put... See, I don't pick when, when we say we're going to preach through Luke. Do y'all understand this? This was not laid out to know what sermon and what scripture was going to be in what place all the way through to the end of Luke. So how did this verse get to be the verse that we were looking at on the first Sunday of the new year? Look, if you think I'm that smart, you need to talk to my wife. <laughs> This is God at work. But here we are. 2014. And we're either going to be good stewards of 2014. If the Lord tarries. We're going to be faithful in the little things God gives us to do. Whether it's with material wealth. Or the wealth of the word of God. Or the wealth of the Holy Spirit's work within our life. And all of the things that God has placed in our life and experience. Or we will not. So notice as you finish the passage, Jesus says, therefore, if you've been not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust, see the word trust in that word, which is also faith, faithfulness, who will entrust true with riches to you? And if you've not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? So as we have not been faithful with the talents that God has placed in our life to use them for God, why would God then put us in charge of other people's talents? If we're not walking in the Spirit of God and being available to God through the spiritual giftedness that the Holy Spirit wants to work out through our experience, then why would He put us in charge of other people to try to figure out where they ought to be using their spiritual giftedness in the body? See, all of this, even within our families, if I as a, a father am not doing the right things myself, how am I going to bring up my child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? And so all of these things are a call for us to say, I'm going to present myself as a faithful steward, as a faithful manager of what God has placed in my life. And if all that means is that I do these little bitty things for Jesus in comparison to what everybody else is doing, that's exactly what I'm supposed to do. Amen. To do anything else. In fact, to try to do something grand would be sin. Because I wasn't called by God to do so. So as we look at verse 13, 
Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one, love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Yeah. Now to serve, to be the servant of, to try to uh, do what is expected of you, to get the approval of, the acceptance of, or the blessing of, God as opposed to wealth. And this happens to us in a lot of different ways. Jesus could have used an example. You can't serve a spouse and God unless you're serving God first. Because if you're serving God first, you will then know how to minister to your spouse. You will then, as you serve God first, know what to do with the money. As you are serving God first, you will know how to handle situations with your children. Not instantaneously. Amen. Wouldn't that be great? I'm serving God. I know everything to do with my kids. And some people think that. But the reality is, is that God is going to help us through it. As we are serving Him first. Can I serve God and wealth? Now, the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. Stop right there. It doesn't matter how well I cause you to think I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. It doesn't matter if I see you doing the right things and saying the right things. When in fact, if there's something going on in my life or yours that shouldn't be there, why? God's not impressed. He knows the truth. So in 2014, I'm either going to get real with me and get real with God, or I'm going to be walking through 2014 deceiving myself and other people, and God's not going to be deceived. The scripture says, do not be deceived. You are going to harvest whatever it is that you plant. And so, here we go with this idea of stewardship. God knows our hearts. Now look at the last part. It's in bold print for a reason. One of those things that jumps out and just kind of grabs you around the neck. Jesus is talking about wealth. And he says, For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. He just got finished saying God knows your heart. If you've read your Old Testament, you know that you get to the place in the history of Israel and Judah where they're still maybe presenting sacrifices in some way to God as they understand Him in their deception. They're still bringing sacrifices. And God says, that's enough! Don't come to my temple anymore. Don't bring your sacrifices in here. When you burn those things, it's a stench to me. But your heart must be changed. See, their heart was filled with wickedness, filled with idolatry. They were still going through the motions. They were still coming to the temple. They were still being friendly and saying hi to everybody and bringing something for the offering that day. And God looked at it and he said, Phew! And so I thought about that. How many of the things in, in my life that, that I lift up as important and highly esteemed, God looks at those things and says, mm, mm, mm. I know your heart. As a church family, as a staff, as a committee, or, or whatever, you may be working hard, you may be trying to do things that are good things. But what is your heart for? How are you serving me as a committee? Are you doing what you do because you love me? Are you, are you concerned about the things that concern me? In your family, in your relationship with your spouse, with your children, with your parents. See, there are a lot of things that we can do to impress people. And, and it's real, folks. It is real that we think very highly of wealth. Very highly of wealth. Paul 
was concerned about Timothy out in the new church trying to present these principles and wanting to make sure that Timothy could convey to the churches the things that Jesus was speaking of. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, we see one of those passages. But godly, godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. Try to sell that on television. <laughs> don't buy our product today. You don't need it. <coughs> and yet, this is what Jesus is saying. What matters then is what we are doing in this world that we are sending on ahead. Because we didn't bring anything into the world and we can't take anything out of it either. That means that the only thing that matters is what we're sending ahead in terms of our faithfulness and obedience to the Lord, even in little bitty things like money. Now, he goes on and says in verse 9, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare. And many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. I had a friend in Houston when I was serving in student ministry there and I lost him to this. Uh, we used to get up early and, and if you know me, everybody here knows how I love to get up early, right? Why are you laughing? I would get up early. And we go over to First Baptist Church Houston. And they have.